No, page 45. Okay. Bezad Hashem, we're going to continue uh, learning our Sefer, Chatzar Yosef. It's available now for all those who are interested. It's a very, very good read in my personal opinion. Of course, my opinion is a little biased, but that doesn't matter. We're continuing over here. We're in chapter 6, section 2, page 45. Again, the book in English is called Courtyard of Yosef. If you search that, you'll find it right away. It says, it's important to, that you see the first two uh, parts of this lecture when we talked about uh, that we're talking about the story of Kamsa Bar Kamsa. We analyzed section one, came up with many Chedushim Baruch Hashem, and now we're going to continue into section two of the story. The Gemara continues. The, the chapter is, uh, section is called Pinpoint Retribution. There's a reason for each title, and we'll see as, uh, as, we, re- as, we, learn the, uh, as we learn the section, we'll see what it means. The Gemara continued off the story. Remember, uh, Bar Kamsa was embarrassed by the host of the party. He picked him up by his hands and he kicked him out. The story continues, says the Gemara. Amar, Bar Kamsa said to himself, we're just going to read it in English, just for, a simple, uh, for simplicity's sake. Bar Kamsa said to himself, since the rabbis were sitting there and they did not protest, I must infer that it was acceptable to them. I shall go and, in Hebrew and in Aramaic, the words are, Echul behu kurza. It's an expression to mean, I shall slander against them. He's plotting to slander against these chachamim, against the Jews. Is he Jewish himself? Yes, he's Jewish, absolutely. If you look at note one on the bottom on, on the Gemara, this is Rashi's explanation of this uh, expression, Echul behu kurza. The literal translation of the term kurza is closer to wink. It means to wink with your eye. Thus the whole phrase means, I shall, I mean, literally translated, I shall take revenge on them through hinting or winking. In fact, the core verse from which the prohibition against slandering, right, the whole thing of Lashon Ara, where is the source for Lashon Ara? The verse is in Vayikra 19.16. It says in English, Do not go as a peddler. Lo telech be'amecha in Hebrew. And in English it's, Do not go as a peddler amongst your nation. A peddler. It's, considered, it's called a peddler. Someone who peddles, pushes forth information, unnecessary information. This verse is translated by Unculus with virtually the same phrase as our Gemara when he wants to translate the term peddler or, or the, the sin of speaking Lashon Ara, he translate this, translates it this way, Lo techul kurzin, do not go and consume or eat or push per, pretty much uh, winking. Connected terms. We'll see how what it means uh, further on as well. The Gemara says, Barkantim saying, I shall go slander against them at the king's court. So he, was, he had connections with the Caesar. He went and he told the Caesar, Roman king, the Jews are rebelling against you. The Caesar said to him, who would say such? But Kamsa said back to him, send them a sacrifice, see if they will sacrifice it. The Caesar proceeded to send, the, send him with a eglat tilta'a, tilta, which means a tripled calf, literally, a special calf, high level meat, he sent with Bar Kamsa. While Bar Kamsa was coming to Yerushalayim with the calf, he placed a blemish beniv sifatayim, which means on its lip. The lip of the animal. And some say the blemish he made was on the dokin of its eye. The certain part called a dokin, or a certain blemish called dokin. In the eye. A place that for us, meaning for Jewish standards, is considered a blemish, which would invalidate an animal sacrifice for our standards of sacrificing animals. While for them, however, who's them? Non-Jews, right? They also used to sacrifice animals for their pagan gods. For them, it is not considered a blemish that would invalidate the animal for sacrifice. So he did a very clever thing here. He put the Jews in a serious predicament. He put put blemish in the animal that that the Caesar offered in, in, uh, some say it was in the eye, some say it was in the lip, a place that for us it's not kosher anymore, but for them, if they were to bring it on their altar, it would still be kosher, which means, you know, as you'll see. Rashi says in the Gemara, sacrifice, that is, a sacrifice to be brought on the altar. We learn from the verse, there's a pasuk that says, ish, ish, which means any man. 
It's very clear, 22.18. And this verse uh, comes to include pagans. It includes non-Jewish people who wanted to bring sacrifices. It allows them. Allowing them to make pledges and donations to be sacrificed just like a Jew can. Right? Anyone had the ability, if they wanted to de- uh, de- dedicate something to the Beit HaMikdash, they could have done it. Now, uh, just as a side point, this page is one of the handful of pages in the whole book where the footnotes continue onto the next page because they couldn't fit for the formatting issue and we had to push it over to the next page. But it's, it's pretty self you know, once you turn the page, you can see. Next thing Rashi says, on its lip, that when these, the uh, blemish that he made on the animal was on its lip, Rashi says specifically the upper lip, not the lower lip. Interesting detail. Next Rashi. For them, the pagans, it's not considered a blemish, but for us it is. He explains, such a blemish does not invalidate an animal for sacrifice upon their altars. Dokin, what is Dokin? He calls it Tila in Old French. That was the language Rashi spoke. Tila. As it says, and he brings a verse in Yeshaya, the one who stretches, Kedok, same root of the word, like a film. Dok is like a film. The heavens. Right? God stretches the heavens like a film. That's in Yeshaya. If you look at note number four, we explain that the word tila that Rashi uses to explain this dokin uh, uh, blemish in the eye, it means a web in French. A web. It's related to, uh, to the English word toil, with the e at the end, toile, I don't know how to explain, uh, pronounce it, which means a thin, almost transparent cloth. Tula? Tool? You would pronounce it tool? Maybe tool, I'm not sure. But nevertheless, it seems that according to this Rashi, it was a certain film of the eye that he blemished in there. Did you read the second part of the story? No, I didn't. Okay, so you're going to have to read it in there because I don't want to repeat it. Okay, there's also note number five over here, um, which goes into a side point into exactly what kind of blemish was it. Uh, the, Rash, uh, the Rashba was asked a question. Some want to translate this as a cataract. That he, he created a cataract in the eye, which would make the animal not kosher as well. Now, the question is, how do you... Why would, why would a cataract be not kosher? It's not deadly. Doesn't have to, no, that, that, you're talking about something else. You're talking about whether the animal is kosher to eat or not. We're talking about whether the animal is kosher to be sacrificed. Okay. It needs to be complete. It's more stringent laws. You're saying eating is less stringent? Yes. Making an animal kosher or not kosher to eat is less stringent laws than making an animal kosher or not or versus not kosher to be brought as a sacrifice in Beit Hamikdash. It's much more, it has to be much more complete over there. Okay, so the Rashi was asked, "How can somebody put a cataract? How, can, how could Bar Kamsa have known to put a cataract into the animal? A cataract is something that naturally develops. You can't poke the eye and all of a sudden it's a cataract." So the Rash, uh, Rashba answered a couple of answers. He said, perhaps maybe the Barakamsa was just an expert, that he knew what to feed the animal, a certain poison or whatever it is, to make the animal develop the cataract on its own. Something along those lines. The other answer is possibly that maybe that he switched the animal. Maybe he switched the animal that the Caesar gave him for another animal who was already blemished in the eye, that had one of those blemishes. That's another possible answer that the Rashba gives. Okay, that's in Note 5, explains over there. Now we're up to the Sha'are, Sha'are Chatzer, the gate of the courtyard. We're going to ask our questions, our very famous and delicious questions, on the section of the Gemara. Did you read the story? I, I suggest you read the story so you understand the questions. So the questions are, why did the rabbis not protest such an egregious sin? Chachimim were sitting there in the host party and watching this happen in front of their very eyes that somebody's being embarrassed publicly and being thrown out, why didn't they get up and try to mend the situation? What is the meaning of the peculiar phase, phrase in the Gemara? Ichul behu kurza, which our Gemara uses to convey, I shall slander against them, right? This, this phrase is very unusual. Maybe there's a hint in it that we shall discover later. What is the meaning of a tripled calf? And why did the Caesar send this type of calf? Right? It says he sent a tripled calf, igla tilta. No, it means that uh, we'll see what it means. We'll see. We'll have some answers as to what it means. Why are blemishes in the lip or eye of an animal considered significant enough to invalidate the animal for sacrifice according to Jewish standards, but not according to other nations' standards? 
Why is that so? That we are more stringent, if you will, where we have more rules. Well, in general, you know, we know we have more rules. But what's so special about the eye and the lip, specifically that if the animal has a blemish there, it's not kosher for us, but for a goy it is. Why did Bar Kamta... Not kosher to eat? No, we're talking about Sacrifice. sacrificing so on the altar. Would they would sacrifice their own, their own animals to their own gods. They had their own standards too. What does that have to do with us? Well, if you read the story, you'd know. The point is, he put a blemish in the animal that was given to him by a goy. A goy king. The Caesar. And he put a blemish that, according to the goy king, his rules, he would say, yeah, you could still, still bring it up. But according to our rules, we would say, no, you cannot. Which puts the, puts the, the Jews in a very difficult situation. Do you bring up the, cat, the animal or not? What do you mean? Oh, I... Do you understand the situation or no? Caesar yes. gave the animals to Kamsa. Yes, Bar Kamsa. Bar Kamsa. To go give to the Jews to swallow. And, and the Jews' temple. Right. Yes. So, why did they so have what? Issue? Why did they have to do it? You know what I mean? No one said they have to do it, but the point is that if they don't do it, they're going to be in big trouble. Why? Because you're rejecting the king's offering. Well, Who do you think you are? Why can't they do the sacrifice with the Goim outside the big Amigdash? No, 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 no. He wanted the Caesar. Wanted the Jews had a temple. The Romans were all, were were governors of the land. Okay. Of Israel. Yes. This is the time when the, the Romans were the land. But this is before the invasion of the Beit Hamikdash. Yes. Okay. This I'm, is while it was I'm, still standing. Yeah, yeah. Historical context. You understand? The whole point. Bar Kamsa came to them and said, "The Jews are rebelling against you." He said, "No, they're not. Why would you say this?" Well, look, he said, "Look, they're not going to sacrifice your animal." He said that. You understand? He planned everything. Huh? They would. Of course. Okay. That was his plot to get revenge. You follow now and you understand the story? Okay, good. So, why did Barkamta blemish the animal in the places that he did? It is well understood that these blemishes invalidate the animal for sacrifice in the Jewish temple while still upholding the pagan standards for sacrifice, which created a serious predicament for the Jewish temple officials, like we just explained. But there are plenty of other types of blemishes he could have made to achieve the same thing. There's so many different blemishes that would invalidate an animal for sacrifice in the, in the temple. Yes. What is the deeper significance of these two blemishes? Why did Rashi feel it necessary to point out that it was specifically the upper lip and not the lower lip also? Rashi says the upper lip. Why? Who cares? The upper is the second. Second to what? What does that have to do with anything? When you build a house, you build the foundation first or the roof first? What does that have to do with this? Explain. The house is the mouth. Okay, so? It was the upper, this is the second temple. You know the difference? The upper is the second. The blemish is on the second. The blemish is on the second temple. Well, technically, a human's root is from the top down. So the, t the upper no, level is yeah. the first one. Okay. If you want to get into technicalities, technically That's two what you got equals one. Manny, what does the foundation have to do with lips? I'll explain to you why. You can't have a house without a foundation. I, you can't have a lips without either of the lips. That's not true. You ever seen a cross lip? Okay, then let's... But you've never seen a house with just a roof. Man, you're not answering the question. You're talking about ones and twos. Why did he specifically in this situation damage the upper lip? Who cares? Okay. Why not the corner of the lip? Why not uh, the nose? Huh? What do you mean? What do you mean? Very simple. There's no extra details in the Gemara. Anywhere. Oh, so let's see. Let's see what the Chachamim say. So first, the, we're going to learn, we're going to up to the Amudei Hechatzer, the pillars of the courtyard, see what the Chachamim of... of of this, over, over the many centuries have uh, offered regarding our Gemara. We're going to start with the Tosafot. I don't know if we're going to get through to the end today, but we'll get started. Oh, it was the upper lip you said? Yes, Rashi says it's the upper lip. Maybe it's because mm. this has to do with the rabbis who didn't speak of unintended, and they're, and they're the leaders nice. of, the, of the generation. So what they are is they're the, the top, the head, which is... Oh, you just went from a bad analogy. That's that. Now that's a better answer. That's a better answer. More importantly, secondarily, of course, with the eyes, mm. also very much connected. Because they see and they didn't because do anything. They saw and they didn't say anything. Ah. So if you want to ask why, so that's, that's the answer. I like it. I got a phone call. Go. Where are you going? You just you just started giving good answers. You're gonna go now. I'm with this.
Okay, so you're on the right track. Let's see over here. Let's see what we can uncover. So first, uh, the Tosafot is going to answer uh, the question of what is the tripled calf, this term. Tosafot says, the term tripled calf means a calf that is healthy and good. Why? Look that? at note number two on the next page. To su- as support, Tosafot brings the verse that refers to Paro's Ill- illustrious chariots. Yes. The Shalishim. The, the Torah calls the chariots Shalishim, which comes from the word Shalosh, three, tripled. But, really, but the word there in that context means officers. There was officers on each chariot. Right? On all of them. It means it's a, it's a level, it means something very nice and high level, basically. Superior. Because his chariots are all from the name of gold. Calf sounds like there's three more. Keep going. Also, regarding the animals that Hashem commanded Avraham to take for the covenant between the parts, right? When he cut the animals in half and then he walked in between the animals. It says there in Parashat Lech Lecha. It says over there, take for, for me, God says to him, take for me an Egel Meshuleshit, a tripled calf. God also says, take, it means a nice, simple answer, a nice quality calf. Triple A. Nice quality, triple A, I don't know. Okay? Sure, um, it's not referencing to uh-huh. the state of three. Let's keep going. Some explain, Tosfot says, that it means the third offspring of the mother cow. Meaning a mo- there's, there's a cow, and the, the cow has one child, second child, third child. The third child that it has is already considered a higher level and more fatty and delicious. Is that what they just said? Because, uh, you know, after the first two sort of like the, 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 the setup or the preparation for her body to be able to develop, to, do, to produce a like higher level of meat. One, is, one plus two is three. Okay, you're foreshadowing to chapter 21. Over there we talk about these concepts. Two plus one, which is also three. That's also very deep. Why it's chapter 21? You're right. It's, uh, it's all about two and one in chapter 21. You see... Again, I don't want to give it away, but the last note in the book says there's, there's a lot of hints throughout the book. Okay, so now, Tosafot wants to reject this answer that it means the third offspring. This, uh, this cannot be so, since it says in Masechet Sanhedrin, they bring a proof from, uh, from another Gemara, page 65b, that while Rabbi Hanina and Rav Oshaya were starting Yesefe Yetzirah, Yesefe Yetzirah means the book of formation, it's one of the foundational books of Kabbalah, that the legend is that Abraham Avinu wrote it. And over there, it's literally set up as like Mishnayot, of Kabbalistic Mishnayot, of the creation of the world and things like that. While these Chachamim of the Gemara were learning that book, in, in, in Masechah Sanhedrin, it says, they created a tripled calf. Over there, it says that you can create certain things. Right? They created a tripled calf, it says, and they ate it. Surely, a created calf was never in a womb to be the third offspring of one. You understand? It can't be the third offspring of a, of a live cow if they created it. The, the same term is used, tripled calf. So therefore, Tosafot rejects that explanation that it's, a, it's the third offspring. Okay? Also, says Tosafot, it cannot be like those who explain that it is a calf which is at one-third of its development, of its lifetime. Since it says in Shabbat 136a, another Gemara says, 136a, that the son of Rav Idi Bar Avin, next page, slaughtered a tripled calf for his guests on the seventh day from its birth. Surely a calf is not one-third of its development on the seventh day of its life, from its birth, right? It's not one-third. So basically they rejected those two answers, and bottom line, it seems like they're going with the answer that it just means a high-level, healthy, and good, meaty animal. Okay? Good. Maharsha... Isn't calf a baby cow? Yeah, baby cow. It's like a, I don't know, it's a veal, veal meat. What I'm saying, softer, nice. it's softer, more delicious, yeah. Okay. Softer. And for veal, there's no makhluk in the Beit Yosef, right? Um, there is, uh, there's more leniency regarding veal for Beit Yosef. It's a makhluk as usual. Again, it's not a halakh class right now. Good question, though. Okay. Let's continue the Maharsha. The Maharsha, as we know, is a very important commentator on these Gemarot. He says the following. The reason the rabbis did not protest was because it was not in their capability to do so. It is possible that this was due to the sin of flattery. Okay, it's hard to translate this word in English. Look at note number uh, six. In other words, false flattery, right? In Hebrew it's called chanipin. It's a 
sin and Exactly. So you, you've heard this before. Mm-hmm. This is when one praises someone who truly deserves rebuke. Okay? It is often due to people, uh, people of power done. It's often, I'm sorry, it's often done to people of power and wealth, right? If someone is trying to get close with someone who's powerful, like LeBron James. they'll flatter them, so you're amazing, you're the best, you're a tzaddik, and really they're not the biggest righteous person, but they're only doing it in order to get in their circle and take so advantage why, of them. Why is that a sin? Because it's, 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 uh, it's we're, we're dishonest. The, but we're giving him the benefit of the doubt. You know you're not. You know he's a rasha, and you're calling him a tzaddik. That's false flattery. I'm not calling him a tzaddik, I'm just saying... But you're, you're praising him. Flattery. I'm... I'm, 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 I'm um, You're praising him. No, but let's see. I'm ex- accentuating his positivity. If there is actual positivity that is known, and you sure are, and, hold on, and you are mentioning that positivity, sure. But if there is no positivity or very, very insignificant positivity, and you are praising him for something he does not righteously des- uh, deserve praise for, that's called false flattery. You understand? It depends what you're praising about him, and if he deserves it or not. Nevertheless, it's a sin. Which is prevalent at the time, says Masha. That's what they used to do, as recorded in, Mas- in Masih Sotah 41a. It says that over there in that time, the, the second Beit Midash, they did these, this uh, mistake, the generation. The reason the animal sent by Caesar was specifically a calf was to hint to Israel that the remnants of the sin of the golden calf was still present, which contributed to the ensuing destruction they were to face. Right? Because we know this whole story led to the destruction of Yerushalayim. We didn't, we didn't get there yet. We're still in section two. That's what would happen. So specific, because think about it. Caesar could have sent any animal. He could have sent a cow, which is a, you know an adult. He could have sent a sheep. Could have sent a ram. Right? He could have sent a pig. Technically, I don't know. I mean, that would have been pushing it. He knows the Jews don't eat pig. But um, I big respect for you. Uh, it depends. But bottom line, he sent the calf. Says the Masha specifically, it was, it was basically from from heaven, designed this way. You hear? Says the Maharsha, this the Caesar sent a calf specifically to hint at the fact that the sin of the golden calf that the Jews did many centuries before, the remnants of that sin was still present and they still were uh, deserving of punishment for that. But it goes so far as to say that if that's present, it was divinely ordained, obviously. Hmm? It was divinely ordained. His wherewithal to do something. It wasn't for his, his, his was, that wasn't his intent. It was from heaven that they put it on his mind to send the calf. Yeah. So, was well, that. Basically, alludes to is that Hashgachah Pratit is definitely something that still exists. It always existed. It never stopped. The foreign nations never stopped. Especially with the foreign nations. Yes. But because we're found many times we're found to be in a foreign nation, like America, like Egypt, like Babylon. Mm-hmm. Now the Marasha is going to offer his interpretation of what tripled calf means. He says the meaning of a tripled calf that he sent. Here is related to that which is written in Masechet Sanhedrin 102a in the Gemara, where it says that until King Yerovam, the nation suffered. Yerovam was a wicked Jewish king of the uh, up in the northern kingdom of Israel. There were multiple kings at yeah. the same time. No generation. I mean d- dynasties. Northern. Yeah. No, there was there was a there split. There was a split. South, southern and northern. Yes, there was Judea and there was Israel. Israel was all northern Israel, the ten tribes. Judea was the was the south. Is this the king that uh, forged the passage so they could go to anything to do Abu Dazara or something? Yes, like that? yes, that, you know, of Am. On Yom Kippur or something like that. He stopped people from going to uh, pilgrimage on the three three holidays. He put I, he put uh, you know idols everywhere. Really? But at the same time, he was a huge enormous Lamit What do you mean? Yep. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Enormous Lamit Chacham. Yerovam ben Avad. You're telling me that a huge, enormous Tamit Chacham decided yes. to put. No, he was not a Tamit Chacham. He just said he was. He was. He was. Hold on. They're not, they're not mutually exclusive. A person can be a Tamit Chacham and a Rasha. What's Tamit Chacham mean? What do you say? That's not true. What does Tamit Chacham mean? Tamit Chacham cannot be a Rasha. What does Tamit Chacham mean? Give me a definition. Oh, oh that's the opposite. Yeah, that's an oxymoron. You can't say Tzaddik Rasha. But you can have a Tamit Chacham Rasha. Sure, there's plenty of them. It's not a given. It's not a given, my friend. Absolutely not. You're mistaken. You're mistaken. You're mistaken. It depends on the person's kavana. A person can sit and learn Torah as a scholarly, th- a scholarly thing. Academics. 
I want to know what the Torah says, the whole oral Torah. I want to be an expert, but I don't really want to follow it. Well, I'll follow it as a guise to, to, to uh, increase my status and make money off you behind your back that you don't even know I'm making, and things like that. Happens all the time. Can we get the direct yeah, definition that's not a Tamil Chacham? Chacham? What do you mean? Tamil Chacham means somebody who knows Torah. Now again, today, the, studies in Torah no, we, we use the term Chacham. only by people who we know are righteous people, and that's proper, we should do that. However, you can have someone who's very, very learned, which means he knows Torah. He studied Torah. What's his name? What was the guy's name? Yerov Am Ben Nevat. No, somebody else that knew the Torah very well. But me, Achitofel is another one. He's a teacher of David. There's plenty of them. Knowing Torah and studying Torah is not a, okay, so is not a guarantee that you're going to be righteous. I wouldn't use that word. To it's a prerequisite to be righteous. You need it to know what to do to be righteous. But it doesn't mean that once you learn, you're automatically righteous. You're no, you have to do, you have to perform, you have to have, a, you have to have a clean heart. You're yeah. saying, if anything, there's a greater possibility for someone who learns Torah, at least in this world, to turn out to be no. on the other side. No, no. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. You're saying that. I didn't say there's a greater possibility. He said it's a great man. He said it's a great man. Okay. Possibly. He's an exception to the rule, but we see those exceptions. It's not the rule. Most people who learn Torah, but listen, you know, uh, you know, Rav David, Rav David, Shlita, he teaches us over here. He has a friend, Chevruta, who he told me a story. They used to sit and learn together in Yerushalayim. Uh, I'm sorry, in Israel, um, for many, many years. 15, 16 pages of Gemara a day, pages, front and back. Okay? Not art scroll, okay? And that was just one well, said that they had. They learned other things, the whole Shukhanuch, all the laws. This guy was a huge Tamil and he is as well. All of a sudden, that guy started learning Navi. Prophets? Started learning prophets. And he came up with all the outside of asked, planted all these questions in his head, because if you learn prophets, there's a lot of big questions over there. Big philosophical questions. How can big people such, do, do such unbelievable things? How could Shaul want to kill David? Shaul was a big Tamil Chacham. David, why would he want to kill him? Only, all these questions come up and, and that's why you need commentary. You need to But bottom line, he let it get to him and he left everything. He left everything knowing the whole Gemara by heart. Okay? He left everything. And not only... Hold on. No Shabbat, no nothing. Yeah, it doesn't keep anything. Now you know what he does? He continues to study though. He can't live without it. It's, all, it's a part of him. But he does it academically. On Yom Kippur, he sits in his notebook and writes, Chidushim. How do you know this? He told me. Wait, so you, what, what, you he told me his story. He came to the conclusion that it's all fake, that it's not real? He came to the, I don't know exactly what it is, but he went off the derech, he stopped, he stopped, follow, he stopped uh, performing the mitzvot, and he turned Torah into, an, into mathematics, academics. A subject, please. A subject of, 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 of mind of, exercise. There's definitely a lot of math in Torah. My point to you is that learning Torah is absolutely essential if you want to fulfill your potential. But it doesn't mean it's a free ticket to it. There's another part called your heart and mind that you have to dedicate. Okay? There's emotion as well. It's not just logic. Emotion is, is, emotions can kill you, yeah, but, but emotions, at the same time they can save you. Emotions are often false. You need both. In Torah you need both. We don't, we don't eliminate both of either one. We need both. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't, listen. Navi is important as well. But it has to be with the proper teacher in the proper context, with the proper understanding, just like anything else. I don't know what happened, what, what, what went over this, this uh, came over that guy, you know. Maybe he had certain things in his heart that were seeding over time and he just used that as an excuse. That could happen too. Yet Sarah is very powerful. Don't, under, don't underestimate the Ever. I, I know. I have, I have a question. Yes. Uh, this is a little off Again, topic. I digress, but whatever, yeah. David didn't see throughout those years that those little like, no. hints that made They were very close out. friends. Very close friends. They still talk. And every time he tells them, no, have you, have you uh, come to your senses? No. <laughs> have you come to your senses? It's very sad. So he knows all these things in and out. He knows the Gemara by heart. The so whole Gemara. His family is no longer there? I don't know, I'm not sure. What his wife and kids do, I don't know. But bottom line, just one example. Okay, back over here. Back over here. We're talking about Yerov Am, right? So, so um, Maharsha says, it says in the, in the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, that until the time of Yerov Am, the nation, Am Israel suffered only on account of one calf. What's that referring to? The golden calf. There's a, there's a continuous payback, right? God the punishment that he had to give us for the golden calf, instead of giving it one shot and destroying us, 
He did it over a long period of time, right? Extended loan, right? And little bits and pieces over history, right? So, and we're still paying for it. So, from Yerovan's time, however, onwards, on account of two calves, meaning now the nation is paying on account of two calves. What does that mean? Look at note A. Yerovan ben Nevat was a wicked king of the northern kingdom of Israel who set up two places of worship for golden calves. He also made his own golden calves. And he set up places of worship and made, made the Jews of, 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 of the people of, of uh, his nation there who lived in the northern kingdom worship it. Our Gemara tells, that, uh, tells us that if, I'm sorry, tells us that from this point forward, it was three calves on account of which the nation suffered. Right? With this calf that, that the Caesar sent being the third. First calf was the golden calf. Second calf was the calf that Yerov Amben Abad set up to, to uh, worship. It was two, he set up two, but they're counting as one. And the third calf, says Marasha, is this very calf that the Caesar sent with Barakamsa. Because the repercussions that would come with that calf was, was, so was enormous. Caesar sent it with the intent of them to worship. No, with the intent of them to sacrifice it. But because they, they didn't sacrifice it, as we'll see in section three, they didn't sacrifice it. War started, and the temple was destroyed. The consequences of this calf eventually led to the destruction of the temple and exile, which we are still experiencing to this day. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so I'm sorry, I mixed it up. So the Mahasha, the Mahasha says the three calves are the two that Yerovam set up, Hold on a second. Look at, look at note 9. Benayahu, which is the Ben Ishchai, he writes similarly as this Maharsha, but with a slight difference. He writes that the tripled calf uh, was to hint at the fact that past sins of the nation involving three calves were still unatoned for. The first one was the golden calf in the wilderness of Sinai. The, the next two were the two golden calves that Yeravam set up. Right? So that's how he counts it. He counts as, because he set up as two. Yeravam set up two. So one in the, in the you know, uh, the, gold, the original golden calf, and two by Yeravam, that's three total. That's tripled calf. So this, this one that, that he sent was a hint to those three. But uh, Maharsha says, no, no, no. The first one that they suffered for was the, fir the first one in the, in, in the wilderness of Sinai. The second one was two and one, really. Yeravam counting as two and one. And the third one is this very one that's being sent. So similar but slight difference. Maharsha finishes up. The blemish that he made on the lip was another hint to that generation. And since they were notorious for their sin of evil speech. The blemish of the dokin in the eye hints at the narrow-sightedness of the generation. Just as the host did not want Bar Kamsa to benefit at all from his feast, shaming him instead, right? So uh, a way to, to, to say stingy in Hebrew is ra'ayin, a bad eye, narrow-sighted. It means stingy also. Right? So that's kind of what the host did. He didn't want to give a thing to Barakamsa. He didn't, didn't want to have Barakamsa benefit from his uh, party at all. So it was all midah connecting midah. Yes. So how comes it's focused on self rather than other? That's another, another uh, interpretation as well. It's also true. Also true. Okay. Next one is the Ketav Sofer. The Ketav Sofer is the son of the Khatam Sofer. He writes, the rabbis at the party did not protest because they knew that the host hated receiving rebuke. Note number 12, to explain this. See the Khatam Sofer, who writes that the rabbis were actually judging Bar Kamsa favorably based on the Gemara in Pesachim 113b. That if one sees a licentious matter, what does licentious mean, Mike? Licentious means promiscuous, immodest, inappropriate. Okay. If one sees such a thing in his fellow, it's a mitzvah to hate him. That's what says in Pesachim 113b. The rabbis reasoned that the host hated Bar Kamsa because he must have seen a licentious matter about him. And so his hatred of him was justified. So the rabbi said, Ah, you see, Bar this is the host, he's, he knows Torah. He hates him because he saw Bar Kamsa do something inappropriate. We must say, however, so this is the Khatam Sofer. Our humble opinion is, however, that this may, be, uh, this may have been a license to hate him in his heart, but it surely could not have been a license to embarrass, his little typo there, we have to fix that. It could not have been a license to embarrass his fellow in public. A most egregious offense. Where's the 
The word bin is spelled B-E-N-E. You see that? You're going to notice it. See, you just read through it. Yeah. Okay. Cannot have been a license to embarrass his fellow in public, a very egregious offense. As it is taught in Masech Barachot 43b, it's better for a person to descend into a fiery furnace than whiten the face of his fellow, which means embarrass him, in public. So bottom line, he was getting embarrassed. So that's one little problem we find that we, we you know, humbly think in the Khatam, in the Khatam, uh, Khatam Sefer explanation. Khatam Sefer continues, top of the next page, page 47. The Ramban writes, he writes this in his commentary on Sefer Shemot, that since Moshe conducted an investigation in the wilderness to figure out who amongst the nation actually worshipped the golden calf and judged and executed them, right, how did he do it? Do you know how he did it? He did, a sot, he did a sota process. He grinded the, the golden calf and he made them drink it. Whoever worshipped it, there was three levels of worshipping it. There was bowing down, there was uh, celebrating. And according to their level of worship, they got punished. It was their punishment. Then the remnant that still haunts Israel today cannot be for actually worshipping the golden calf. Since those who worshipped it actually already received their punishment. Right? So how can you tell me that we're still paying today for the sin of the golden calf if Moshe Rabbeinu already at, immediately after made them drink it and whoever worshipped them died? So the, the, he cleaned it up back then. So what are, we, what, are, what, are we, what are we exactly suffering for? Which sin? Rather, it must be that the remnant of the sin of the golden calf for which Israel st still presently suffers is the sin of those who do not worship it. Right, Because whoever actually worshipped it, bowed down, bow down to it or brought a sacrifice to it, died. Back then, so that was their atonement. So what was the sin? But failed to protest those who worship, who did worship it. It's also a sin, right? All the other Jews who didn't, who didn't directly worship it, they watched. They were bystanders and didn't protest. So to an argument, Moran Bar Kamsa brought a calf to hint that the rabbis at the party should have protested. I mean, that's the sin we should suffer for today. If any sin that we should suffer for today from the golden calf, it's the one for not protesting. And that's why he brought a calf to hint to the rabbis, you didn't protest. Just like that golden calf. But we have so many laws not protesting, it's not so simple. You're right, but these are rabbis, they should have known, no? These aren't simpletons. These are people, and the leaders of the, of, the, of the community who should have known to, to step up. Yeah. How come none of them are answering the mouth and the lip question? Uh, we'll get to it. Listen, uh, they don't all answer every single question. This is just what they wrote. And bring what they write. The questions are ours that we had immediately after reading the Gemara. And then we start searching through the answer to what they wrote, their commentaries. Now, doesn't mean it's, it's going to contain the answer to every question. The Chatzar Yosef answers. Absolutely. The Chatzar Yosef would not let you down. All the answers are there. According to our humble opinion, of course. You don't have to agree with them, but I think they're pretty good answers. This is why he made... The, the, uh, the blemish on the lip of the calf. Ah, here you go. This is his answer now. Says the Ketav Sofer, why was it on the lip? To stress the point that the rabbis who were present should have used their lips to protest. We had many who suggested this answer. Furthermore, the blemish he made in the dokin of its eye surely covered the eye somewhat. Okay? Right? I mean, it's like it's a certain blemish that covers the eye. Not covers, but it's like a a hole in the, a blind spot, basically, in the vision of the eye. This was a hint to those same rabbis who watched such an egregious sin with their, with their eyes and closed their eyes to it as if there was something obstructing their vision. You understand? You with me, Mike? Yes. Okay. It says now, the Be'er Ma'im Chaim, very uh, nice commentary, Hasidic commentary. On the, on the Torah. This is written by Rabbi Chaim of Chernovich. He writes, <clears throat> in his commentary to Parashat Balak, he writes, the term Niv Sefataim, right, that's what the Gemara says when it says the lips, it was on the, the blemish was on the lips, it says Niv Sefataim. It literally means the dialect of the lips. It refers to the lightest form of speech. What does it mean, lightest? Number 16. Emptiest, like like uh, empty conversation. That's what it means. That which was not for a higher purpose, right? It's talking just idle chatter. Dokin of the eye refers to the lightest form of sight. Look at 17. Indeed, the word dak, which is the root of the word dokin, it means tiny, light, precise, 
Dak, that's what it means. Tiny, tiny, tiny. So he says the word Dokin of the eye, the, the phrase Dokin of the eye refers to the lightest form of sight. Looking at things that are not for the sake of Hashem. Meaning looking at things you shouldn't be looking at. These deficiencies are not considered, this is a very chaserish thing, right? This is their style, and it's good. These deficiencies are not considered blemishes when present on an animal for sacrifice for the rest of the nations, right? The king of the eye or the nephs of the time, because they, are not, because they, meaning the goyim, are not required to police their eyes and mouth to that extent. They're allowed to, they're allowed to say whatever they want to an extent, right? They can speak idle chatter. They're allowed to look at. They have no, you know. Uh, yeah, they have no um, prohibition. They cannot act. The prohibition is to act on. They cannot do uh, certain uh, illicit relations, right? But looking necessarily is not a prohibition for them. These deficiencies how, are, however, considered a blemish for a Jew, because saying and looking at the wrong things make it difficult to develop a closeness with Hashem. That's how he explains why for us. Those little blemishes in the eye and the mouth of the animal count so I versus a, a goy. I have a theory. Go ahead. Mike has a theory. Rabbi Davidov's friend was probably looking at things he shouldn't have been looking at. I don't know. No, I'm not saying maybe. Uh, I don't know. immoral. I'm saying maybe text. I don't, I don't know. I'm, he just told me the story. Again, I, I wish him well. That's sort of what it says. Okay, perhaps. But how do you keep yourself from happening like that? From breaking down like that? Because we also know a person. Being honest with yourself and having good leaders. But Always we, having a good leader. Also, we also have and good friends, a good support system. Who read a book and read that book and said, oh, I went non religious because of this book. What? What do you mean? No, I said we know a person who became non religious because of a book. Of a certain book. What is it called? The Perplex, the Guides of Perplex? Oh, yeah. Like yeah, again, you have to have, uh, you have to have a, a, a rabbi who guides your learning, who knows you very well, and then you should ask him, Rabbi, I want to pick up this book to learn. What do you think? And based on his expertise of who you are and your personality, he'll be able to guide you whether or not you're ready for a certain book. Right? That's why it's also not good to just automatically, and this is a big fad, people jump automatically to Kabbalah, which is amazing and delicious, but if you don't look at it and learn it with the proper guidance, you can very easily get confused and turned off. I know plenty of stories of people that happened to. Have have now again, I know of a handful of stories where it didn't happen, where they, they went straight to Kabbalah and they're, they're religious. You know, they're, they're not huge Talmud Chachamim. They don't know the halakhot that they should know. But they, uh, you know, they have a religious family and, and, and they're very strong and love God and they learn love Zohar. Okay, fine. Listen, so for some people it works. For, but it's, it's dangerous. More often than not, probably, uh, uh, statistically speaking, a person who jumps straight to Kabbalah without knowing Stop being an expert in halakha first is uh, not going to do very well. It's not going to reach its full potential. More often than not. Okay. So now, it says over here, Ben Yehoyada. He's going to give us his interpretation. And maybe we'll end with this. He says, Surely the rabbis did not sense the matter. They didn't sense. They didn't feel what was going on, he says at the, at the party. They did not see that he took him by hand and forced him out. Right? The Ben Yehuda is giving the benefit of the doubt to those rabbis. He says, it couldn't be that all the Chachamim were sitting at the party and watching this like a, and eating popcorn watching it. No. He says, they, they were busy or they are talking to somebody or they, they didn't see what happened and it wasn't a public thing. He just took him and threw him out. Discreetly. That's the Ben Yehuda holds. But isn't the whole uh, situation that he embarrassed him publicly? Exactly. You know, this, this, this is a serious problem and how the Ibn Yehuda understands our Gemara's. We will, we will mention this and we'll address it. But this is his opinion. He says, Bar Kamta wrongly thought that they saw, that the rabbi saw, and still decided not to protest. So he's saying, it was all a huge mis... mis, inter, mis uh, what's the word? Mis... Understanding. understanding. Yeah. So if you look at note number 18, the Ibn Yehuda cites a Midrash in Echaraba, which records a slightly different version of this story, of our very story, and sometimes in Midrash it comes up as well. As support for the notion that the rabbis did not see the host remove our kamsa. Right? So then he says, look over there, look in the Midrash over there, if you look at the story version over there, you see that for sure the rabbis didn't see what was happening. However, I looked it up, and I didn't get it. This is troubling, since the Midrash over there, if you look at the Midrash, it's in Echaraba 4.3, the Midrash does not even mention that the host forcibly removed Bar Kamsa by hand at all. All it says is that it told him to leave. See there if you want. 
He didn't, didn't say he took him by hand. He told him to leave. Verbally. Perhaps the Binyam Hadah had a different textual version of the Midrash. I don't know. This is a difficulty. So he continues anyway. He says, When Bar Kamsa said, Ichul Bahu Kurtza, this uh, expression, I shall slander against them, he was unknowingly speaking directly about himself, his own name. How? Since the word Behu, Bet Hevav, in Aramaic means them, and the word Bam in Hebrew means them. Bam is Bet Mem Sufi. A different permutation of his name yields Bam Karza. Slander against them. Right? So you have to, you have to uh, ba, right? So you take the word Bar Kamza, take the letters that spell Bar Kamza, you can rearrange the letters and, say, and it will say Bam Karza. Slander against them. I mean, that's who he was. He was the one who slandered against the Jewish people. Basically, you're replacing the, the Mem and the Resh, and then one of the Vavs can be replaced as well. We explain in number 19 how, you, how the Vav can turn into a vowel, and it works out. Bar Kamtza can turn into Bam Karza, that he slandered against them. Furthermore, about Adam's curse, it is written, Kotz Vedardar Tatsmiach Thorns and thistles will sprout out against you. That was one of his curses after he sinned. Thorns and thistles. That means when he's working the, the field, uh, it's not just fruits that are going to grow. These unnecessary things that bother you are going to grow. The mist, huh? Like weeds. Weeds, but also thorns. Yeah. Thorns and thistles. The mystics say that kots, the word kots, which means thorn, represents a dark spiritual entry. Again, this, that's on a simple level, but everything in Bereshit is so deep, talking about multiple levels of depth, of Kabbalistic depth. So one of the explanations is that the word kot thorn represents a certain dark spiritual energy. Bar Kamtza, who separated himself from Israel, attached himself to this kot, this thorn, because he became a thorn in the side of the nation as well, right? He became a bother. He also received the curse in the Torah that says, Arur, cursed is the one who strikes his fellow in private, which means speaking about speaking Lashon Ara in private. The Torah curses such a, uh, such a person. That's in Devarim 27-24, at the end of the Torah. Which refers to an informed... Meaning to yourself? No, no, no. Meaning uh, in private, like one guy speaking bad about a person to another guy. How is that in private? You're speaking to another person. Meaning it's not in public. That's the point. Basit, that means it's not in public. One other person is still considered private. Three people is considered public. Yeah. So how is one worse than the other? Well, what do you mean? Private, worse than public. It's not worse, it's cursed. The Torah says cursed. I say it's worse. Cursed. The Torah says cursed is the person. Cursed. I'm sorry, I think it's worse. Cursed is the person who shall speak about, who, will, who strikes his fellow in public. It literally means make. Make means to hit. So you would think it means if people got in a fight at home, cursed. No. The Chachamim explain that it means if a person speaks verbally about another person, not physically strikes him, verbally strikes him in, in private. Not meaning to the person. Speaking bad about another person. Slandering. That person is cursed. The root of the word arur, cursed, is alef resh, ar. Putting ar, alef resh, together with kotz, which is thorn, kuf vav tzadi, yields kurza, slander. The same word that he used. It sounds like kamza. <laughs> yeah, right. And, and we said, if you could rearrange his, his name, bar kamza, you could get bam karza. He slandered against them. It's all hinted in him in his name. Let's let's finish up this one paragraph and we'll call it a day. On the Binyan Hoda, it was divine supervision that caused the Caesar to send uh, with Bar Kamsa a calf instead of a lamb or ox or any other animal. He says that from Hashem he made him bring a calf. The purpose was to hint that the time for the destruction of the temple and the ensuing exile had come part of which was due to the sin of the golden calf. As is taught in Masechet Sanadim 102a, there is no punishment suffered by the Jewish people that doesn't have within it a portion of atonement for the sin of the golden calf. The blemish that Bar Kamsa made on the lip was also the, via divine supervision, to hint that the sin which caused this punishment was that of evil speech committed by the lips. We saw that again. According to the opinion in our Gemara, who says that the blemish of the Dokin was its eye, the hint is that the time had come for Esav's sovereignty. And Esav is the father of Rome. 
It's time for Rome to rule, for Rome to take over and destroy the Bet Midash. Esav's staple is Ra'ayin. He's called Ra'ayin, which means evil eye. And the gematria of that is 400. The number that defines Esav. 400 is the number, number that defines him, as we see throughout the book many times. How do we know that? It's written in Torah, and behold, Esav was coming with 400 men to meet, to meet Yaakov. 400 is his number of deen. Baruch And there's other notes that we can leave on the side. So well, that is the Ben Yehoyada. Next week we will continue with the Maharal Bezat Hashem. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen v'Amen.